Um, and hello, everybody. If you're listening and um, you can see this, see us on the stage, um, we'll we'll be um, starting at the top of the hour. We're live now, um, and we're just getting our sounds and everything else adjusted. And we're going to give everybody about five minutes to come in and um, hang out. And so hopefully you can all see us and hang out with us for the day. And we're really um, excited to do this first um, broadcast of the OKD testing and deployment workshop. And so we're really glad that you've joined us. And um, we've got myself, I'm Diane Mueller, Vadim Rotkovsky, um, who's from calling in from Bruno. And Charo Groover, and where are you, Charo, in the universe? North Carolina? Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia. And Jamie Magria is with us um, from the University of Michigan. Um, and there are a number of other guest speakers here today from um, who will introduce themselves as they, as they come along. Um, and we're just excited to um, try out this new platform. So bear with us if we have slight technical difficulties. This is a new one. We used it for DevConf CZ and with good success. Um, and uh, we have some really interesting um, deployment configurations that we wanted to share with you. And we really want to hear about um, your deployment um, uh, adventures um, and requests. So uh, this is going to be some, some fun today. Let's just see the event. And, and I'm just going to go in. I'm in the event chat right now. So if you can see us, all four of us, Shri, can you just make sure, um, let me know that you can see all four of us. Um, yep, all right, perfect. Um, so now we can't say anything bad about any of our friends and family. But um, we never would do that anyways, hey, Everett. Um, so we're going to wait until just the top of the hour because um, we did say this thing was going to start um, at 9 o'clock. And we're going to do some dapping and, and hang out. And so all four now, perfect. Jump, he dropped out for a moment. Perfect. All right. Um, and while you are getting ready, if you haven't already joined um, the mailing list, I'm going to pop that mailing list here into um, into the chat so you have something to do while you're watching us um, this is um, if you want to get on other events come to the working group meetings that's the link to go to um, and um, i would be remiss if i didn't also invite you to join openshift commons so i'm going to grab that and throw that into the chat as well And here you go with that one. So if you haven't joined um, OpenShift Commons, you can go there and do that. All stages, Kareem, are going to be recorded. Everything we say and do today will be recorded, um, and including the, the sessions. Um, so, and I will upload them as soon as Hopin, which is the platform we're using, gives them to me um, up to the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch them um, and play them back. And as such, we'll also, um, and I'll say this again at, in two minutes, I think, one minute. Um, then I'm, and we'll, we'll show you where, where you can find things and um, get started. So I'm going to share my screen now, guys, and um, we're going to rock and roll and see if I can do this all. And sharing screen and... All right, uh, you should all see the OKD Working Group um, site here, okd.io. And so if you're joining me, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. I cannot see the chat right now, Jamie, so I'm in full screen mode. Um, so I'm just going to motor on here and expect someone to interrupt me if something goes south. So Jamie's my co-organizer, Jamie Magria from um, University of Michigan, has kindly um, 
offered and is the back in the background here with me today. So I'm totally grateful for Jamie's support. Um, if you don't know me, um, I'm Diane Mueller. I'm the Director of Community Development here at Red Hat for the Cloud Platform Group and one of the co-chairs of the OKD Working Group. Um, and so a little bit about the logistics today. Um, we are using a new platform, Hopin, and so you have the ability to um, ask questions in the chat and we have the ability to share our screens. We've set this up so there's two hours in the morning uh, that we're going to walk through what I'm telling you now, um, a little bit about what is OKD. Um, Charo Groover, who is um, formerly with Old Dominion Freight, um, is now a Red Hatter. Thank you for joining us, um, Charo. And um, then we're going to get a walkthrough um, of the OKD4 release process and a bit of a tour of GitHub and where resources are that we're going to be using um, in the release processes by Vadim Rutkowski. Um, and he's a Red Hatter and an engineer here. Um, and then we're going to get a walkthrough of uh, install deployment to vSphere using the UPI approach by Jamie. Um, and we're not actually going to do it. We're going to just walk through the bits and parts of it um, so you, everyone in all of the other sessions can see where they can find the resources. And then we're going to bring on um, Joseph Meyer from Rodion Schwartz, who's been an active community member as well, and um, one of the, the great folks who's been working on um, the OKD.io site and who has just turned on the blogging capabilities. And so someone asked in the chat already where um, things would be after this. And so I will post a blog on OKD.io with links to all of the YouTube videos, um, as well as to our Google group. Um, I'll send a note there as well afterwards with all any slides, any YouTube videos for all of this. And then um, we're going to ask you to divide and conquer yourselves into the breakout sessions. Um, and we have four of them set up today. We're going to do the deep dive into vSphere on UPI. Um, and Jamie and Joseph are going to lead that. Um, and then um, we do have, um, hopefully, uh, it's not TBD, so I'm typo on my part. Uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan and um, Justin Pittman from Red Hat are going to walk through the bare metal UPI um, with you guys. And then Charo is going to lead um, the single node cluster deployment workshop uh, with uh, Bruce Link from BCIT, um, the British Columbia IT group, uh, IT um, community college, um, which is you know, awesome uh, to have Bruce with us today. And then um, there's going to be a, an interesting one in the home lab setup. So many of you might have read Craig Robertson's um, home lab uh, blog post. Um, so he's going to walk through a bit of that. And then Sri Ramanjam from Dado is going to walk through his um, version of that. And after each of these little walkthroughs, um, there will be Q&A via chat. Um, and we are going to answer your questions. We're going to ask you about if you have a home lab, how you're setting it up. If you have bare metal, what difference you did. And the whole, all of the details for all of these things are in um, a set of documentations that are living in Mike McEwen, who is also um, in the background here um, in the chat. And he has graciously set it up in his repo. And we're going to be trying to get you to do um, log issues against the docs um, and make a pull request. Or if you have another home lab or a different approach to something, um, to make a, a request to add that documentation in. So we're trying to fill out our install and deployment um, documentation. So my end goal here is to get all of you to participate in the working group and to help us drive our um, documentation um, updates. So and let's go forward one more. So today, um, like I said, in the hop in chat, please ask your questions. Um, and the moderators, myself, um, uh, Vadim and Jamie and others will be popping around in each of the sessions. We're all um, empowered to do that. And then we will try and um, relay them to the folks who are uh, ask, uh, delivering the content and get them answered. And then um, we'll just do some deep dives into this. So that um, El Mico repo that you see up there, and I post, I'll post it into the chat after I stop sharing these slides. Um, that's where the, uh, the working drafts of the OKD deployment configuration guides live that we're going to be using today. Um, the OKD docs live in docs.okd.io. And after today, um, we're going to hope that all of you join, if you haven't already, the Google group um, and come to our meetings. 
if you haven't found them already in the Kubernetes Slack channels, there's two other channels, OpenShift Dev and OpenShift Users, where you can ask questions. And as always, um, uh, we would love it if you um, joined OpenShift Commons. And OpenShift Commons is organizational based. So if you um, go to the participants list and you see your company's name already there, your company has already joined. Um, and I can just add you in and add you to the Slack channels there as well easily. And if your name, company's name isn't there, just click on the join form and fill it out and we will get you rocking and rolling. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and or I never stop talking, but um, I'm going to stop sharing and um, we're going to switch over and get Charo Groover. And exit and see if I did that right. And so now, Charo, who is going to stun us with his, what is OKD? So take it away, Charo. And you're almost in full screen. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to the Testing and Deployment Workshop. I'm going to give you a quick overview of OKD. Uh, we're going to start with uh, an overview, talk a little bit about where we are current state of OKD, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about operators and the operator hub, and then finally um, leave you with a whole bunch of links and references so for how you can get in contact with us. So OKD, what is it? It is a community distribution of Kubernetes, but it's actually more than that. It's a community distribution of Kubernetes that is actually built off of the OpenShift code base. So it's, it is the same code that you are running in your data center or on your cloud provider if you are a Red Hat OpenShift subscriber. This code base is what we build OKD from with, with very little, if any, variation. The only variation, really, is the fact that rather than running on the Red Hat Core OS, we're running on the upstream of Red Hat Core OS, which is the Fedora Core OS. So you've got the OpenShift code base with uh, Fedora Core OS as the underlying operating system. And as Diane mentioned earlier, you can reach us at okd.io to find documentation, reference materials, uh, and code-ready containers built from OKD, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. So like I said, this is a community distribution, it means it is built and supported by a community, um, some of whom you're seeing on your screen right now. The, uh, the whole premise behind OpenShift as sort of a Kubernetes plus uh, distribution is that automation is king. Automation for installation, automation for patching and updates, and automation for resiliency and recovery in your data center or your cloud platform. The like any other Kubernetes distribution, its heart and soul is really the orchestration of applications and services that provide value for your business or your organization. Um, underlying that is base Kubernetes, the, the platform, the cluster management, the security, the monitoring, embedded registry, everything that you expect from, from a Kubernetes distribution with a, a twist of additional automation provided by the, the OpenShift++. Uh, as I mentioned, Fedora Core OS is the underlying operating system on which the whole thing is built. And Fedora Core OS itself brings a, a lot of what provides the automation and the resiliency to OKD as a Kubernetes distribution. You can run this on just about any platform you can imagine. Um, we're not quite to uh, ARM64, but you can bet there are people who care about ARM64 and would love to see this thing running on the edge. 
So right now, all of the major cloud platforms, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, GCP, the Google Cloud Platform, you can run this on OpenStack, you can run it on Overt, and as some folks are going to demonstrate today, you can run it on VMware and bare metal. So let's talk a bit about where we are today. We've actually come quite a long ways since the major shift a couple years ago from OKD 3.11 to the OpenShift 4 that OKD 4 is built on. We are currently in our 4.7 release with 4.8 not too far out on the horizon. Um, we've been taking a lot of community contributions that are improving this platform and making it much richer as we continue to evolve. We've got active collaboration established now between both the Fedora communities for our underlying operating system, as well as folks who are contributing to the operator hub, uh, which we'll, we'll talk a bit more about here in a couple of slides. Um, there are quite a number of bespoke operators that are now available for OKD to provide all kinds of value add for your clusters. And one of the things that this platform really allows you to do outside of like a subscription-based OpenShift is enabling early adoption of upcoming technologies, especially with the underlying Fedora Core OS. You get a preview of, of what's coming down the road, which sometimes can bring a extra level of excitement, but always brings an extra level of functionality that you can take advantage of. And we've also just recently, oh, it was probably six months ago, I'm, I believe it was this summer, we, we got Code Ready Containers um, finally released for OKD4. Code Ready Containers um, for OKD is based on the Code Ready Containers code base uh, for OpenShift. So, so just like everything else that we do um, with Red Hat, it's all open source. It, it all accepts community contributions. It enables you to run a single node OpenShift cluster on your laptop or workstation. So it gives you all the goodness that you get with an OKD4 cluster and Fedora Core OS on your local workstation. You just have to add your code. Um, one quick note on that, the, the Code Ready Containers release that is currently um, hanging off of our OKD.io site is still uh, built on 4.6. If you're watching a recording of this video, uh, it's very likely that the 4.7 release is out. So those of you who are watching us live, um, look for the 4.7 of Code Ready Containers to, to be available here within the next week or two, hopefully within the next couple of days. Vadim and I are working on a couple of things that, that we got to get in place so that uh, the, the build will run off of some fairly significant changes to the underlying Fedora Core OS and a couple of the operators that we need to update the, the code base to support CRC. So look for that to come very soon. Operators, operators are what make OKD run. In fact, the very first thing that happens when you're bootstrapping an OKD cluster is an operator is taking control to coordinate the rest of the installation. Operators provide infrastructure as code with intelligence behind them that monitors the state of the resources that the operator owns and is responsible for ensuring the stability, the resiliency, as well as the patching and updating. So operators are like a, a bundled system administrator that is always with you, always watching the application and ensuring that it continues to run. Uh, the core of OKD is built on operators so everything that provides the functionality from etcd up 
is is controlled by operators but operators also bring value add so if you need rook ceph as a storage provisioner well there's an operator for that your internal image registry is an operator if you need a kafka cluster there's a stream z operator uh, if you need a service mesh well there's an operator for that too so operators are a way to bundle the capabilities that give your applications uh, the the added richness resiliency and capability that you need so that as a provider of software solutions all you have to focus on is your code and let the operator take care of everything else the operator hub is where you can go to to retrieve these and install them into your local cluster when you have a cluster up and running the operator hub will be there and from the console you can navigate to the operator hub and go shopping when you stand up an okd4 cluster all of the operators that are available you will be able to install uh, free of charge there are not subscription-based operators uh, in there they will be the community supported versions of the operators that you would see if you had a subscription-based openshift cluster so if you need grafana or strimzy or service mesh with istio they will all be there and installable from the operator hub now, another quick caveat on that. We, we are still working with several of the, the um, operator providers to ensure that the community version of the operator is available in Operator Hub. So some of them you do still have to go to the, the GitHub repo or um, wherever the operator lives to get the installation materials for it. But as we continue to evolve this ecosystem, more and more of those operators will be there. And when you get your cluster up and running, you'll see that there's already a very, very rich set of operators available. Finally, we'd like to invite you to come join us. This is a community-driven ecosystem. We're very active, the OKD working group and the Fedora Core OS working group. Uh, we have several members actually that participate in both uh, to a greater or lesser extent. You can find the OKD working group at the following links, which I'll leave up on your screen for, for just a few seconds. So you can screen grab or type down whatever you need to do to find us. We also have a calendar that will give you access to our biweekly meetings. They are open, so please come and join us. And the same thing goes for the Fedora Core OS working group that is available at these links. And again, please come and join us if you're interested in edge networking, if you're interested in seeing uh, ARM64, or if you're interested in seeing this run on other metal platforms, come and join us and contribute your knowledge, your skills, and your time to our efforts. We are a community-led organization. And the final thing I'll leave you with is a list of links where you can access our resources and come and talk to us and with that i'll say thank you and i'll turn it back over all right well next up we have vadim ratovsky um dialing in from bruno and he's going to walk us through um the current release process and tell us a little bit about where things live in GitHub. So Vadim, you want to share your screen and take it away. Hello, my name is Vadim and I work for Red Hat and my uh, day job is being an engineer for OpenShift, but um, in the Unix, I like to tinker with um, OKD and other community distributions. So uh, today we'll take a guide on about how OKD gets built, where things happening, uh, where's the source and uh, why do we need such a complex CI to make it happen? So our final step in the release process is uploading the binaries of installer and OC to GitHub. But in order to make it happen, um, we first need to build it from the source code. And as everything else, things are happening in the organization called uh, OpenShift, where the code for both OCP and OKD being created. For those who 
are not familiar with uh, some acronyms. OCP stands for OpenShift Container Platform. That's a product which Red Hat officially supports, provides a subscription to the clients, and OKD is a community distribution which is related to OCP as well. So let's have a look at one single simple repo, which is called Origin Branding. Uh, it contains several simple things. First of all is the Docker file, because all pieces of um, OKD and OCP are container images. So this Docker file explains how to build it. We're building uh, from scratch. Then we copy the files in the manifests and label this image as an operator. That means, um, as Chara has explained previously, everything in OKD and OCP is based on operators. So we have a top level operator called cluster version operator, which all it does is applies all the pieces um, to your cluster and they assemble into an OpenShift release. So the manifest we're applying is in fact a simple config map which instructs the console to use OKD branding and set a different base URL. Uh, when the OpenShift console is started and it finds this configuration, it applies the OKD branding and in the help message, you would have a different documentation base URL. So all of those changes we're looking into are built by CI. You can see we get green marks, meaning it has passed, and everything is done via the pull requests. For instance, here is the output of our CI. We're using um, Kubernetes testing for a project called Prowl in order to build, assemble, and manage our images created by CI. For instance, here we can see that we're using origin for eight image stream as a base, because all of the images we make release from are in fact stored in OpenShift itself, and they are stored in the form of the image stream tags. So we use 4.8 as a base, build branding image, tag it back into the temporary stable image stream, and we don't run any particular tests because it's just one single config map, and we immediately promote it back to for a image stream. And we promote just this single part. So that instructs CI to um, build the image we have submitted, uh, run some tests if they are present, for instance, in other repos who might have additional end-to-end -end verifications for AWS, uh, same test for AWS, but an upgrade test using previous state and a new release with this image, GCP, vSphere, and so on and so forth, depending on what kind of repo that is. And once we're done, it would promote it as an official image in the 4.8. So um, the whole release part is stored as a part of image stream in our CI. And once we're done, um, the CI would also track that image stream and would be building new releases out of that, meaning um, you would be able, it would be able to compile them into one single image, which refers to a bunch of other images and fetch some metadata from them. For instance, if we would use OC Adam release info command on some release images, we would be able to extract URLs to each particular commits this image has been built from, uh, as you can see on this picture, for instance. And um, since CI can do that, so that users can also create their own release payloads based on the payloads we released already, replacing some particular images with the fixes they would like to test or some changes they would like to, to have performed. Um, another important part in this is that OKD is sharing a lot of images with OCP itself, meaning um, 
using the project called Red Hat Universal Base Image, we are now able to officially release images which are built on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Back in 3.11 days, OKD used to be based on top of CentOS, but now we can use the very same image based on UBI, and that very same image can be used simultaneously in OKD and OCP without any branding or legal problems. And that allows us CI to stop doing a duplicate work. And uh, once the commit lands in the branch, we are able to build an image, promote it to OCP, and at the same time promote it to OKD. Uh, for instance, this script would show us that uh, Cordon's image in the latest origin or so-called OKD payload is the same Cordon S image as in one of the releases of OCP. We're fetching the pulls back for those image. And once we use command OC image info to display information about labels, layers, environment uh, variables, and so on. And if we diff the output from this image, the only difference is just the name where they are being pushed. All the rest is the same because these are the same images. Next, the most important part is our release controller page, where it, that's the front end of our CI, which detects that when a new release lands in, a new image lands in the image stream, we can prepare a new release. Let's look at something more greenish like this one. And it builds the difference between the previous release, shows that two new images have landed. Based on the metadata they contain, we can also build links to the pull requests which have caused this change, and so on and so forth. And these nightly images um, can eventually be promoted to stable, for instance. This latest 4.7 release used to be a nightly release with the same date. And in order to perform a stable release, we have a small instruction. Uh, what to do, it basically boils down to mirroring the image to Quay, uh, running some additional tests, and tagging it in the state for stable channel. All the rest is done by CI itself, which automatically updates the update graph, runs additional tests, and we can see that users from the previous releases can upgrade, and what's the test result for that? Um, since the OKD is slightly different from OKD, or OCB, as it uses different images in some cases, we also have a different issue tracker. We use OpenShift issues to track OKD-specific problems. However, since most of the um, images we're reusing from OCP, for instance, console is copied as is from OCP. So any kind of UI issue you're hitting would be reproducible on uh, OCP as well. That means you would file a proper OCP image because you, you would be sure that it happens for OCP as well and you would get direct developer attention to, to fix it. And um, once we're there, we also request you to, um, let me pick one of my favorite ones. Let's pick the closed. Uh, we also ask you to provide a log bundle, so-called, where a lot of logs from the failed installation or broken cluster itself. Um, that archive should contain all the logs for us to find out what's happening, well, which part do we need to fix or what's missing. Um, and after we're done, we're also uploading the client tools to GitHub and send a message to OKD Working Group. Um, to, to reiterate, in the end, OKD is a community distribution. That means all the images 
we're listing here have their GitHub repos, meaning you can rebuild them, tinker with them, replace some parts, and um, collaborate with us to make it better. Uh, we make decisions on the work group calls. Uh, those are recorded by Diane and released to our YouTube channel. Um, OKD4 is no longer an upstream, midstream, or downstream of OCP4. It shares a lot of images with it, but still has its own uh, special replaced parts. Uh, so we coined the term sibling distributions for this uh, kind of an event. And uh, we heavily rely on automation and CI verification and also user feedback when we are releasing uh, OKD. And that concludes my demo. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Vadim. Um, and and uh, you know, as someone mentioned, I think <clears throat> just uh, for future reference, when um, you have a black background and you're showing something, it's a little blurry in the refresh rate, so maybe a bigger font size next time. We're, we're all learning here, too, so uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. But um, that was great. So if you have questions, um, folks, please ask them in the chat. Um, we're, we're running pretty much on time, maybe a little ahead of time even, which is great. Um, my theory um, is that this whole upfront section, which is going to set us up for the sessions, will take two hours. We may have a little extra time at the end. Um, in which we will all go grab coffee, more water, or and some of us will stay online and answer your questions um, if you have them. And um, then on the, for my, I'm on Pacific Standard Time at 11 o'clock, we will switch in and the sessions will go live and you will be able to join then. So if you're wondering, um, I can't advance the sessions to start earlier um, with Hopin, so they will start on time, especially if people are coming just for the session, so we don't want to start them early. So um, with that, um, Jamie, I'm going to bow out because we can only have four faces on stage at the time um, and let you do your talk and bring Joseph in because um, he's got the talk after you. And then um, we will kick Charo off. I think I just picked you um, when Joseph finishes and I'll come back in. So just so everybody knows, this is this is the logistics of the day. So um, Jamie, if you would like to, to share the screen and um, give us a tour of the documentation, um, we'll queue you up and take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, folks, for uh, joining uh, this overall um, community gathering uh, and for joining the sessions later. Uh, for folks that are just tuning in, uh, there will be sessions uh, broken up, four different sessions, actually, for the different types of, of uh, installations, basically, that you can do. So what I'm going to be providing uh, right now is just a quick walkthrough of a installation on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure. And what does that mean? Well, so user provisioned infrastructure means that um, instead of the installer uh, configuring a load balancer within vSphere uh, or uh, configuring the IP numbers or any of that, uh, that this is all done with infrastructure that the user provides on the outside before they run the installer. And so the prerequisites for that uh, are basically handling DNS, DHCP, load balancer, and optionally a proxy. Uh, and Joseph is going to get more into the details of, of doing these specific things. But in short, uh, you're going to need uh, some DNS entries for uh, the bootstrap machine. You're going to need uh, three entries for your master nodes. Uh, OpenShift clusters uh, right now support uh, three uh, master nodes in the control plane, as it's called. Uh, and then you're going to need an entry for each of the desired workers, uh, and also an entry for your endpoint and for your uh, your API endpoint and your API internal endpoint that the nodes use to connect to each other. And then a wildcard entry, a wildcard DNS entry. Uh, of the form uh, like this, uh, so that once you've deployed apps on there, uh, by default, they would have the app name dot apps dot cluster name at your domain. And um, to give you an, an example of uh, that, so um, for user prov provisioned infrastructure on my end, um, I'm utilizing um, the 
uh, DNS uh, that is provided at the University of Michigan, which is a system called Blue Cat, uh, running on Proteus. Uh, and so this is um, a way of um, very easily uh, configuring DNS uh, and DHCP. And so you can see for my demonstration cluster that you'll see more of in, in the session that I'm doing, um, uh, basically you can set up your DNS and this is what it would look like, right? So you've got your masters uh, and your worker nodes uh, at set IPs. And uh, GCP, um, I didn't fill in, fill in the details there. This is something that um, you'll want to do uh, in most cases. So the way OpenShift clusters work, you can do static IPs or you can do DHCP, uh, but you cannot do both. Uh, and this is, um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, basically um, when you have uh, chosen to go one route, you can't go back to the other. So if you're going to do static IPs, you can do that by setting some kernel pr parameters with something called afterburn. Uh, and this is something that you pass to in the configuration of your nodes. Um, you pass a string, a configuration string that's handed to the kernel with your static IP. Um, or you can uh, rely on just the DHCP on your network and any address that's handed out. Um, alternately, uh, I took a third path, and I'll get into more details in my session, um, of using reserved DHCP and setting the MAC addresses on the nodes. And there's some advantages to that for UPI that I'll talk about. And um, you're also going to need a load balancer uh, outside so that uh, incoming requests to the API and the ingress uh, get passed to the um, respective machines, right? So uh, in terms of a um, load balancing, we've got a load balancing proxy, proxy uh, that uh, is called a um, big IP from F5 networks. Uh, and so uh, in my configuration, I use a big IP, which allows you to define pools of machines. Uh, so here you can see uh, this is the uh, API pool uh, and this is the worker pool. And so this will load balance requests to their respective pools. And uh, there's also some, uh, one thing you don't see here, but I'll be showing in more detail is you can also do some checks. So for those of you that are familiar with the internals of Kubernetes, you know that there are health Z and um, ready Z uh, rest calls that you can make to get the status of um, of your uh, cluster, of your nodes in your cluster. And uh, in the F5, you can actually define those types of checks as well. So be performing those checks externally. An advantage of this is that if you, uh, if your entire cluster goes down and, and the internal notifications aren't working, you have an external source of notification and monitoring uh, to see that. And I'll get into more details of that in, in the other session. Uh, another thing that you would need is a proxy if you're going to be on a private network. So this is something that um, OpenShift has been growing into. When it was originally uh, in versions 3, I, I should say, um, and less, there wasn't as much focus or support for um, private networks. And that's been increasing. But if you're going to be doing uh, a private network, you will need a load balancer for uh, or a proxy uh, for your uh, calls out of your containers uh, once you have your cluster up, but also for the installation process as well, pulling down those containers that are part of the installation process. So uh, in terms of a proxy, um, you can use Squid. Uh, Squid is a, a freely available um, proxy that is very easy to set up and, and has a simple configuration file. Uh, and I'll be providing some examples of that uh, in the session that I have. And uh, if you look at uh, the documentation on the OKD website, uh, there is a link to uh, installing and then subsections. And so here is the section uh, installing on vSphere. And then there's uh, another subsection under that, uh, installing on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure.
And that is um, uh, what I've been working with. Uh, and this um, has a lot of great information. Um, I would encourage folks when they're trying um, either using the standard install or the user provisioned install functionality, either one, check out the UPI documentation for the platform that you're using. The reason that I suggest that is the UPI documentation shows you some of the things that are needed and some of the underlying details of a OpenShift install. And it can be really helpful for understanding overall how the process works. Um, and it's sectionized um, quite well uh, and shows you what you'll need in terms of your nodes and um, about creating the user provisioned infrastructure and uh, ports that you'll need and whatnot. So definitely check this um, documentation out. And one of the things that they've done is they've broken it out into um, several sections with the more levels of detail that you want to control, the higher resolution of detail that you want to control in your install. So there's a section installing a cluster on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure and network customizations. And so that one, for example, uh, will provide you details uh, about setting static IPs and disk partitioning and some of the other stuff um, uh, that is uh, um, more um, a higher resolution of, of manipulation uh, of the install process. And uh, the install uh, usually takes about, um, uh, about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and in the session that I'm doing, I'll be talking about how you can automate that process, uh, literally to be able to just run a script and configure, um, generate the necessary install files and whatnot, uh, and load those uh, into newly created VMs, uh, and then kick off the OpenShift installer so that you, you get uh, a um, very near to um, non-UPI installation experience and actually some extras. Let me bounce over here to, to provide a, an overview of some of the files that are involved in a UPI installation. So what you'll see is um, uh, after you've generated what are called ignition config files, um, you'll see uh, uh, a bootstrap ignition config. And ignition is the um, uh, basically, the uh, metadata that's used that you put into the metadata of the node uh, to tell it to connect to the bootstrap server, or in the case of workers, to connect to the control plane to download the necessary components to join the cluster. And so you'll see multiple ignition configs for the bootstrap, for the master, for the worker. Uh, after you've run the installation, there are some hidden files, uh, an install log, and a state file the, that says the state of the cluster. Now, there's one thing that I want to point out um, for UPI installations that is true across the board. Um, uh, and it's something that sometimes surprises folks is that the installation, the OpenShift install binary, um, actually ingests and deletes um, your install config. So you'll have like a general install config that you'll um, configure the parameters for, for your cluster. Uh, and they reference that um, in the documentation, what you need uh, to have in that. One thing that happens though, is when you run the installer, uh, it actually eats that file up. So you'll want to always make a backup of it um, I'm trying to find an example of it here. You'll always want to make a, here we go. You'll always want to make a backup of it uh, so that you can control, uh, or so that you can duplicate uh, the process uh, again without having to do a lot of work. Uh, and the tool that I'll be demonstrating that I wrote uh, actually allows you to, to have a template and then it, it duplicates that template and then goes from there so that you don't have to do anything uh, by hand. And that is the overall process of uh, installing with vSphere. Um, basically, you generate your files uh, and um, 
uh, you deploy your infrastructure, uh, you generate your files, uh, and uh, then you create the nodes with the metadata from those ignition config files, and then you run the installer. So that's a general overview. And uh, again, if you want more specifics of that and you want to see an automated example of that, then uh, please uh, check out uh, the session uh, that I'll be hosting with Joseph. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing myself uh, and then we'll move on. All right. And um, we have successfully brought Joseph Meyer into the fold here today, and um, we are running pretty good um, timing here. So um, I'm going to let Joseph talk about some DNS, DCHP um, issues and um, best practices. So Joseph, you want to try turning, unmuting yourself and sharing your screen? Yep. Okay. Hello, I'm Joseph Meyer. I'm from Brody and Schwartz. It's a German Munich-based company. Um, I'm uh, working with OKD um, since more than three years now. We started with OKD 3.10 and uh, yeah, um, moved the road over um, OKD 3.11 to OKD 4. Currently we are um, there. Um, OKD helped us a lot in, yeah, my company a lot in um, getting in touch with Kubernetes and gaining the skills for that because Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes is not um, yeah, an easy, easy thing. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we used OKD to learn that all. And now we are in a stage where we move parts of our um, Kubernetes clusters to OpenShift um, for having more production loads and getting the support from Red Hat. Um, yeah, and now I try to show you a little bit about my first, or <laughs> what I thought are the, the heaviest steps in the beginning. Um, if you start with um, user provisioned infrastructure and with DNS, DHCP and an external load balancer. Um, can you see my, my screen share? I hope so. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, this is a diagram of my home lab I'm running here um, at home. I'm using uh, I'm using uh, VMware vSphere. I bought a license um, for that's very suitable for home lab users. It's it costs um, around 150 bucks. It's called um, VMware User Group Advantage Edition. Um, you have to pay 150 euros for a one year license. I think that's pretty affordable for home labs. Why do I use um, vSphere at home? Because I like to have an environment here in my home lab that's similar to the one I use in my company. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm using the MBA vSphere. It's running on a, on a Ryzen PC. It's a very uh, capable one. It has 16 physical cores and uh, 32 um, uh, with uh, multi-threading enabled. Uh, you don't need that much cores. Uh, don't be frightened of that. But I like um, to have possibilities um, to yeah to add more workers to um, play with new things um, one thing I tried at home is um, virtual um, openshift virtualization uh, based on kubevert and this requires a little bit more horsepower um, than you normally have on your desk or on your laptop so we have a um, one uh, PC for VM there this year um, I have another um, computer running um, an Nipec attached storage. I'm using Truna's course, the community edition. Um, but this year, Truna's scale uh, will um, go into general availability. 
I like that because um, this one will have a small Kubernetes cluster running on it where you can deploy your Helm charts. And I like to have some um, components outside of my OKD cluster because I'm constantly um, deleting and creating clusters to test new things. And I, uh, yeah, I like to have um, the possibility to have some components outside of uh, my cluster. Um, yes, and on the top of the image, you see my DNS DHCP server and also the load balancer um, component. It's running on a Raspberry Pi. Maybe you ask yourself why I'm not running on helper VM in my uh, vSphere environment. I'm doing that because I also constantly uh, uh, deconstructing my vSphere environment to test things. And uh, I'm also using the DNS and DHCP server for, yeah, for my home uh, environment, not only for my home lab. So I need something that's running all the time. And a Raspberry is pretty fine for that. So um, yes, and I have a DSL modem, a router that's uh, connected to the internet. And um, the first thing you should know, um, if you want to set up a DNS and DHCP server at home, you should um, be sure that no other uh, of the servers is running in your in your subnet. In my case, I had to turn off the DHCP server and the DNS server running in my in my um, DSL router before. Well, I have to say in between because for sure during the installation you need um, internet access, you need DHCP DNS server if things go wrong. Um, but um, if uh, the uh, custom built um, servers are running, you don't need the uh, yeah, servers in the Fritzbox anymore. What do you have to achieve here? Um, on the VMware vSphere um, server, there are a few VMs created during the installation process. Uh, just for your information, I use the instructions um, from uh, the GitHub repository of OKD. It's located in github.com, OpenShift OKD. There are some guides, also one for UPI vSphere. And uh, this guide, one of these guides uh, uses uh, Terraform. That's a tool that uh, can take about infrastructure, uses a domain-specific language for that. And uh, there is also a Terraform provider available for vSphere. I have seven VMs, one Bootstrap VM, three masters, and three workers. Um, you don't need so much VMs. Uh, nodes normally, I have, uh, this is my standard setup. I don't want to yeah, um, take care about um, with uh, limited uh, CPU and memory space. I want to go and have fun. That's because it's uh, seven VMs. And the first step in the installation is that um, the Bootstrap VM starts creating a fake control plane. Um, this takes only, I think, a few minutes. It depends on how fast your internet speed is. If you have a local registry in your home lab, then things uh, can be um, um, faster because of improved um, network speeds normally have in, uh, in your home lab. The second step is that in addition to the bootstrap node, you um, have your master nodes. The master nodes are constantly um, using the load balancer that's running on the Raspberry to um, get the ignition configuration files from the bootstrap node. And if the bootstrap node is uh, in a later stage of, uh, stage of its uh, installation, it will provide with a local web server this ignition file to all the masters that are, um, they are um, constantly polling for that. If they get this uh, ignition files from the bootstrap VM, they are provisioning themselves. Um, they normally boot twice, uh, boot once, sorry, um, in minimum um, to um, boot into a new version of your 
operating system and you um, fit or a chorus version because you start initially you start with a yeah with a um, VM template that's run that's stored in uh, vSphere and uh, beginning from this um, operating system version the VMs are running waiting for the ignition file say get it fetch a new or the say OS version that's uh, um, determined for uh, a certain OKD release, they are booting into the new OS version and join the fake um, control plane that's created, um, that's running on the bootstrap node. If the control plane is running, then in the next step, the bootstrap load, um, node stops serving an ignition file. The load balancer will uh, see that and turn off the bootstrap communication. In this phase, you could in theory, um, delete your bootstrap VM because you don't need it anymore. Then um, the worker VMs, they are running all the time and also um, fetching an ignition file for the workers from, at this time, the control plane that's uh, running um, with our masters. They are constantly pulling for that. And if the master control, as uh, a control plane is set up, um, Again, a web server will serve the ignition file for the workers. The workers will fetch the ignition files, load the current version of uh, Fedora Chorus, boot into it, and finish the installation. And afterwards, you have a running OKD cluster. So to achieve that, um, that you have a load balancer and DNS, DHCP server, you have to set up a little bit in advance. I created um, some documentation about this process. Don't get frightened. It's uh, it's uh, lots of text. I only will sweep um, fast over that. Um, I think I used a lots of uh, standard um, documentation you can find on the internet. It's nothing special about that. I um, because I'm not using the DHCP and DNS server for the home lab, but uh, yes, for all my home environment, I turned on um, dynamic DNS, so new devices um, automatically register themselves to the DNS server, so I don't have to maintain a list uh, there um, manually. And uh, for that, I have done this. Um, maybe you have seen my description in the presentation that I have a net here. Um, it's a, um, a subnet um, a slash 24 based. I have my IP from the router. We will see it a few times. We have um, the IP address of the Raspberry Pi running the DHCP, DNS, and load balancer. I have two domains. I have my home lab net domain where everything in my in my home is um, register, registered to and then i have a subdomain uh, c1 it's uh, c1 means a cluster one um, home lab net where all my um, kubernetes nodes my okd nodes are um, running inside my, i have a dhcp range and i use a static ips for the most important nodes um, because I yeah because I, I try uh, lots of installation strategies I like to have fixed IPs for the most um, nest, uh, for the most important uh, VMs and for them I use static IPs for sure if I create dynamic uh, nodes um, through machine sets later um, I can use a DHCP for them. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I use a mixed scenario for that. For them, first you have to do the usual things. I use uh, Raspberry Pi OS for my recipe. I update the package list. I give them a static IP. Then I install ISC DHCP server. In my case, I use that for the DHCP server. I set up. Um, the Ethernet port configure. I do the basic uh, configuration here with this 
with this file. And uh, the first section is for dynamic DNS. Um, yeah, it's not nothing special about that. I um, here this section is um, served by the DHCP server every time a new node um, requires an internet address. Your etc resolve conf file will uh, be filled by parts of these options here. Here we have the definition of our subnet range of uh, sorry our DHCP range, and here are the um, the um, static IP sections where I use the MAC address that is configured by Terraform in vSphere to um, serve the VMs that are registering themselves or um, asking for IP addresses, um, fixed IP addresses. I do that for the bootstrap master nodes, worker nodes. And yeah, that's sets it for the DHCP server. The next thing is uh, setting up um, the DNS server. It's a little bit, yeah, more files are involved in this because I use bind for that. I started with DNS mask, but I was not convinced um, with its features. I, so I, I threw it out very quickly and used bind. Um, also for that, you find lots of information in the internet and it's nothing special um, in the configuration about that um, that I use. We have a access control list here where I say every IP from my subnet in the home lab can access the DNS server. I have, uh, yeah, I configure it also as a forwarder if a, DN if a domain name is not uh, known to the DNS server, it will forward its request to our, I think it's Google, the Google DNS servers in the internet. Here I turn off a few security um, switches because I had problems with that and I, yeah, I don't have the energy to find out how to make it really, really secure. But uh, um, I will improve that the next time. It's a, a, a side task I gave uh, myself. Here, I define my zones. Um, I have a home lab net zone. I have the zone where OKD uh, will run its VMs. Um, it's referencing a file where I um, configure the records as um, described in the official documentation. And I have a reserve, uh, a reverse zone set up because it's uh, yeah, it's best practice. You, you don't really need it for a home lab, but um, I'm using it because I, I wanted to try out how to set this up. Um, here we have a few. Yes, this is a, the zone file for my home lab. Um, in real life, uh, lots of entries are here um, because I use uh, things other than OKD. Um, that are using this DNS server. And this is a setup from a reverse lookup, a reverse zone uh, file. So here is now is the interesting part because here we have the zone file for C1, cluster one home lab net. And you will see, uh, yeah, lots of uh, records here. These are the records that are required by OKD to work. We have here a wildcard um, C name. That's uh, everything here is going to the load balancer. This is the internal API uh, Jamie talked about. We have an external API uh, record. Here we have the workers, the master, the bootstrap node, and the load balancer node. That's pretty much is it. The next section is um, the load balancer. It's the third and last component I have set up on my recipe. Um, HA proxy is a load balancer. I, I like it. I like it much because it is rather easy to set up. It's fast, and yeah, it's it's yeah. Don't get confused by this section. It's 
um, pretty much default. You have a dashboard where you can see um, which which uh, backend nodes are available or responding um, and um, which are not. We have here the load balancer for the API. Here we have a load balancer for the ignition um, configuration file server. And um, because maybe you remember, it's the first uh, step is that the bootstrap node will serve the ignition files. Um, afterwards, also the master files will serve them. And if they serve the ignition files, the bootstrap node, the bootstrap node will stop serving the ignition files, and the switch over is controlled by the load balancer. And here we have the routes, the port 80 for HTTP um, load balancers, and it's the same for HTTPS. I have um, provided all my nodes to the load balancer because um, I like to move the um, OpenShift or OKD router around between the nodes to test things. That's why I not only have the workers in the list, but also the masters. If you reboot your node, you should check if all system D services are still running, or if there are um, errors thrown out, you can use var log um, syslog um, to find, to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. But my experience is that if you follow this guide here, it's uh, not so much as it looks like, um, then normally it should work uh, rather fast. And then in the end, you have external components, um, load balancer, DNS server, DHCP server. Um, it's a setup, I think it's rather common in, in lots of companies, I could imagine. That's why I use this and not say, yeah, easier to set up IPI um, installation method. And uh, because I want to try out things um, that I have also uh, available in my company. And that's uh, pretty much uh, everything I can tell you about that. Thank you. Diane, I will right. uh, switch over uh to you. Perfect. Um, and um, thank you for that. I, we were, when we were discussing how to run today, um, one of the things that we, we figured was generic to everybody's deployment was, was figuring out these bits. And um, so Joseph, thank you very much for taking the time to walk us through your experience with that. And we'd love to hear everybody else's um, uh, experiences. And we'll probably rinse and repeat that um, a little bit during some of the um, sessions here. Um, we have a bit of time um, right now, and um, I think what I, I would like to do is to take a few minutes um, uh, to see if anyone's got questions in the background, um, in the chat. So if you have a question for any of the speakers, and if any of the people who have spoken so far um, and others um, want to jump in and to the back stage again, um, that would be Charo, I think, and others. Um, that would be great if you could do that now. I'm, uh, we're all, as I keep saying, learning this new system. So um, hopefully you don't have to log back out, log back in to get the backstage. But Charo, if you can jo join us again. And um, I don't think Christian has um, has managed to, to join in there. But um, if you have questions, um, that would be great. Um, in the interim, um, Vadim, I know you showed off um, uh, Charo's wonderful issue with the good documentation and the right comments and tags and everything. Maybe if you could well, just take one more moment and um, walk through that and, and talk a little bit about why that's a good issue. Um, and, um, and then we'll wait and see if people have some questions in the chat. Um. Sure. Um, so, the core of the problems is that there are different assumptions on what people try to deploy and versus what they expect to happen. But there are lots of errors on the way. There are simple errors which we can prevent. There are a lot of 
things from internal infrastructure which we have no aware of. So we've hit this problem during 3x days where we ask people to show some random pieces of logs, um, show the package versions of this and package versions of that that took quite a while. In the end, uh, during for a OKD4 and OCP4 design, the goal of collecting necessary information has been uh, right on the day one. So we came up with two different tools to have that provided to us for any initiative. Uh, one of them is log bundle collected by installer that basically gives us all the logs from bootstrap node. If masters are available, we also fetch their logs. Since all of that is centered around Kubernetes, meaning we can collect a lot of information from installer using Kubernetes primitives, like installer version is stored in the config map. So if it gets stored in the log bundle, I don't have to request a person uh, to ask which particular binary have they been running. It's been recorded already. Um, that prevents us from a bunch of issues. Like I think I ran 4.7 installer, but in fact, I typoed and accidentally run the 4.5 installer and so on. Uh, that can happen that no one is to blame, but what we want is actual uh, auditing of all the events. So the Charles issue already had a log bundle, which gives us a lot of information, like which version are you installing, which installer has been used for that, what infrastructure is it running, have masters joined already. That saves us a lot of time from asking a person directly and finding out the truth here. Um, so we've created a template in our issues where that is being recorded. Of course, some issues don't require a log bundle. They're clear as a day, for instance. Um, OKD clusters don't have a branding setup. That's pretty easy for us to fix and you don't have to provide it. But if you would, that would be very nice, of course. Um, we are also working on, we also work that log bundle and OC Atom uh, must gather archives do not contain any sensitive or private information. Uh, it still might slip in. So if you could review that file and say that accidentally some secret with my uh, password to vSphere is being logged, that's another bug, of course. Uh, but um, if you, if the issue has a log bundle that gives us a lot of information so we can get start working without spending a lot of time on figuring out different details, of course. Um, yeah, so that's basically that. Awesome. Um, and I'm testing using a poll here right now, um, and I may have blown it already by showing the results before I actually ask the question. <clears throat> So I don't know, can can one of you try and test that? Can you still vote in that poll or do I need to recreate it again? No, I think the poll still, the poll is in the event, not the stage. Okay, okay, here it comes, somebody's testing it. So it's still live there, perfect. So that that's great. Um, there was one question from Jesper um, in the chat um, and I'm not sure which one of you would like to um, try and attempt to answer that, but it was, um, you didn't quite get the note on IPI and what is the state of OKD IPI vSphere install installer? Is it fully supported? Um, and here's some. And the docs are a bit sparse, scarce on the subject as far as you can see. And that's why we're here today too, is docs is what we're all about right now. So um, who would like to take that one on? Vadim, Charo, Jamie? Yeah, I can take it. Uh, so OKD, as a community distribution is aimed to be providing all the install methods, all the functionality of the OCP platform, but built on top of community um, things. Meaning you would get all the install methods. There is a discussion about assisted installer and so on. So that's definitely on the table. Uh, however, there are bugs. For instance, Azure installer is in a very poor shape, mostly because Red Hat as a company can communicate with Microsoft as a company and add Arcos to the marketplace. And you would be able to start a new Arcos image 
uh, from scratch that doesn't take time. But uh, OKD is based on top of Fedora CoreOS, meaning Fedora as a community has to talk to Microsoft as a company and convince them that Fedora CoreOS is a viable distribution. It needs to be landed on the marketplace. That's the core part of the installer. Other parts are absolutely there. So what users have to do right now is to upload it manually, start a temporary VM so that they could use the temporary image they have uploaded and run the Azure installer there. From, from this point, everything goes uh, just like it was started in GCP or AWS or anywhere else where we already have Fedora Cross images uploaded. But this initial blocker where we don't have Fedora Cross uploaded to Azure Marketplace is really stopping us now. And when it comes to vSphere, as you can see, vSphere is incredibly popular here. And we've already added um, a vSphere test for every single nightly. Uh, it is limited. It, it may seem totally broken down, but what we see is the limitation of our CI, which we will be fixing with InfraGuys. And it has uncovered another bug where OKD in particular, unlike OCP, is using a lot of images from uh, Docker Hub. And eventually, trait limits us, and some tests fail, which ensure that samples operator for our CentOS 7 images is failing. So we'll, while we fix that, it may seem entirely broken, but vSphere API is one of the biggest goal on our CI. And uh, every time we propose a change to OKD, one of the first questions we ask, will it break a bunch of users who are using vSphere API? Um, when it comes to UPI, um, we have a test for that, but again, UPI is always different for everyone as is designed because user has to come with their infrastructure and what we have in our CI test might be entirely different from what, what you might have in your home labs or company setup. So while the test for the UPI would show that things work, it doesn't mean that they would work necessarily in your infra. That's the, that's how UPI works. So we are not very rushing with adding UPI tests because while CI might show everything's perfect, it doesn't mean that users are actually succeeding. On that front, we're relying on direct community um, feedback, meaning you broke static IPs, for instance, and so on. So we collect logs, try to figure out, is it the infra problem or is it uh, the OKD problem? We had a question from Mike McCune a little bit early, uh, earlier in the presentation on the, on the stage chat that I wanted to get to. Um, uh, Mike asked, uh, Jamie, the DNS records you reference are those just A records or do you add the pointer records as well? So this is interesting and actually brings up an interesting topic uh, that's been particularly relevant the past couple of months. So uh, in my vSphere UPI setup, I am using uh, both forward and reverse records in my DNS configuration. The reason for that was because I was utilizing the reverse lookups of the nodes OS uh, to get the host name and the fully qualified, the fully qualified host name. Uh, in uh, what was that end of November, uh, beginning of December, uh, an issue was introduced upstream from Fedora where the precedence of um, methods for, for determining the host name was rearranged. Uh, and what I relied on, reverse DNS, uh, actually was pushed uh, to the back and a, a mechanism further up front was to just name the node Fedora. So you ended up with a bunch of nodes all just host named Fedora. Um, there's a workaround for that right now, and there's also a script in my repo to go and launch onto the nodes uh, and fix their host name. Um, but yeah, I, I still do rely on reverse, uh, and I think that's something that should uh, be supported, and there's, it's working its way uh, through the system to address the issue that, that was uh, introduced. So and Vadim might also have some more info on that as well. Yeah, it basically builds down to network manager bug. 
the problem here is that we OKD community have our own goals to deploy a fully functioning cluster, but Fedora Cross is a broader scope, meaning if they break us, we still have a voice, but our voice is not the only one. We have to carefully clarify why this is important for all Fedora Cross users. Um, in OCP, situation is entirely different. It's much simpler. Everything, Marcos is designed solely for our, uh, for OCP. If OCP is broken, meaning Arcos folks have to say, yes, sir, and go fix it. Um, in community, things are much more complex. Uh, so it might take some more time, but um, I think we had a great experience with the network manager in particular. We've reported a bunch of bugs for them. They are very responsive and um, we can skip a few layers here and go straight to Fedora, Bugzilla, and ask them because they seem to be quite familiar with what Fedora Cross is, what OKD use cases are, and the amount of testing we provide is very helpful for them as well. I have to unmute myself. Uh, there's a, uh, Bruce and Joseph are having a little back and forth here about um, whether or not Joseph has used um, HA proxy um, to use ready Z endpoints for checks. Um, I'm wondering if Joseph, if you want to pop back into the, the panel and, and talk up oh, there, we go. I'll add you in. Here you go. And Bruce, if you want to join too, we, since we're not sharing screens, we can have more people in. No, I have not. <laughs> that was a short answer. <laughs> um, the the other secret reason I wanted that you're also having a side discussion there that I can see around Azure with um, John Fortin. Um, so maybe if um, Bruce, if you, if you want to join too, I, I'll add you into the background. Unfortunately, um, I can't add uh, John Fort Fortin. But if you, um, Joseph, if you want to reiterate a little bit about um, the what you found with running on Azure, um, it works. Um, you don't have to change anything in the installer, no no tricks. Um, you just need a fast internet connection because um, because Fedora Core OS, the base image is not available on the Azure marketplace. You have to bring it uh, to Azure. And this means that the installer has to download it first locally where you run your installer, afterwards upload it, uh, expand it first to I don't remember, I think eight gigabyte and uploads it, um, has to upload it again to Azure. And this takes more than a half hour on my side, at least. I upgraded my internet connection, but um, normally the way to go is to run the installer in an Azure Cloud Shell because the, uh, the speed, the internet speed, if you are in Azure is uh, much, uh, much higher than um, you normally have at home. And there, I always get a 100% success rate to install um, OKD on Azure. It works pretty well, but uh, yeah, it's the only only change to a normal installation is that you have um, to download the Fedora Core image. I don't understand. I I, I really don't understand why that is uh, so. Um, but yeah, I accepted it, and. Uh, that's also a reason why we use OCP or Azure Red Hat OpenShift for Azure instead of OKD because uh, this seems not to be released in the, in the short term. All right, cool. And I, we're having a little technical difficulty getting uh, Bruce into the back um, here to ask his questions too. So um, we'll and to answer his, his questions there. Um, all right, folks, um, I, I did run a poll, which I think is, you know, always fun to test out the functionality here and the results of how people are using OKD. And um, it's pretty much 50-50 uh, with production and home lab use, which I think is interesting because um, um, I love all you folks who are using it in production. Um, John and Jamie and um, Bruce, who's coming in the back, and there's Joseph. Yeah, you guys really are, um, we love you. 
Um, and then the home lab folks are very interesting to me too because they give us some really nice um, feedback and um, help on board and train people up. So that's great. And nobody's experimenting at their company, which is what I would be doing with OKD if you, you know, once I've seen all the issues and everything going on, I think I would be reserving it for um, some experimentation. And somebody is um, using it for something else. So if you're in the chat, whoever said other, what are you using it for? See that I don't see an answer to that, and I can't see who answered, who answered other either. And just to clarify for what I'm using it for, I'm actually using it for uh, um, doing um, a, a development platform for folks, for developers at the University of Michigan to uh, get familiar with OpenShift and uh, test their applications and deploy their applications. Uh, and then I'm also doing builds, testing the build process. So I have a separate OKD cluster that's just getting rebuilt all the time uh, to do tests of installations and various things. Uh, so so Selatin um, uh, just nodded in. He must have been the other, or uh, that person must have been the other person. Um, and um, that was his or her answer. And not in production, but dev test environment, which is kind of, um, to me, that, that's the experimentation um, phrasing uh, that, I, that I was thinking of, that, that it would be really a great place um, to do your, uh, your dev and your testing. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Um, and, and we do know, um, you know, there are quite a few people who are using it in production. I'm always um, surprised. Um, maybe that's just because I'm so risk averse myself. But um, it is, and it is pretty much, uh, I've seen a lot of um, use like Jamie's describing um, and Bruce, if, if he manages to get in um, at uh, uh, .edu's as well. So I saw there were a few other folks um, here. I think there's someone here from one of the Hong Kong universities and other places, but that's also um, a nice way to get people trained up um, on using containers and understanding cloud native technologies too. So. There's been a lot of um, .edu's that have been um, consistently in the community for the past, uh, I, you know, I've been working on OpenShift when it was Origin and now renamed OKD. Um, and that's really consistently been a, a, a good testing ground um, and training ground for people um, in the .edu space. So um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and, and it has been a wonderful collaboration with the Fedora community. And um, I can see a few things in the chat where we've you know, tended in the past maybe to blame Fedora kernels for being buggy when it was something on the OpenShift side. Um, and I think that collaboration that goes back and forth between the OpenShift engineers, the community resources and OKD and the Fedora folks has really been amazing and very healthy. So um, we're really uh, kind of excited about that. So Carl is asking now, what would you use for production orchestration if not OKD? What do you mean with uh, production orchestration? You mean for containers? I, I'd use an OCP uh, cluster <laughs> with a subscription uh, to, to Red Hat, but I might be a little bit biased. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because um, OpenShift is, as um, Charo said in the, um, in, the, in the intro on what is Open OKD, it really is Kubernetes plus plus. There's a lot more in it than just um, DIY uh, Kubernetes. And so it's sort of what we're seeing is a lot. Of, I, I like to think of Kubernetes DIY as the pipeline for people who want to use OKD, right? So you go and you deploy Kubernetes and then you realize you don't want to manage that. Um, and the operators um, concepts um, it, really have, have changed the game, I think, in deploying and installing and managing um, this container orchestration. So, um, and Vadim has some, uh, some, has some opinions too. So why don't you... Um... I think a lot depends on what, what purpose are you filling in with OKD and what's your use case, basically. We, I don't work for sales, but for what sales told me, they always start is what what goal are you about to, to complete? It doesn't mean we would start selling you Ansible or OpenStack or whatever. 
matters is that you would succeed because that ensures that the collaboration would be long term and so on. And the same for our community. If you would not use Zokiri, that's entirely fine, but we're interested in which calls would you like to have completed? Because Zokiri might fit in there or another tool might be useful. For instance, I run a plain Fedora CoreOS uh, image because it already has Podman. And if I don't need to change it a lot, I could just run a couple of containers, leave them there. It would be automatically updated. And you probably don't need a complex container infrastructure and management for that. Um, so we would need more details on why not OGD, of course. But in general, obviously, you might want to pick OCP because it has support. That's basically the only difference between OGD and OCP. Yeah, in all seriousness, at my I, I, I've only been with Red Hat since uh, August of, uh, this past year. So, so at my previous employer, we actually did run uh, OKD clusters, a lot of OKD clusters in our lab environment. And, and I used it um, in one way, very similar to how Jamie's uh, using it at, at the University of Michigan. It, it was a platform to teach developers in a safe environment that, that they could destroy the entire ecosystem and nobody got hurt. Uh, it was also a way for us to, with, without having to impact our Red Hat subscriptions, uh, it was a way for us to try out new releases of OpenShift before we updated any of our production environment, and, and we ran OCP in production, and, and having the the confidence that OKD is built from the same code base as OCP uh, allowed us to, to do that experimentation. Yeah, and I would echo that. That's so. Actually, at University of Michigan, we are doing um, OKD and OCP and also doing Fedora Core OS, and I run Fedora Core OS um, single, just as a single OS, uh, and do some development work on that. I would encourage folks to check out Fedora Core OS. Um, we've given it a little bit of discussion here, but it is basically an operating system for container usage uh, and container development. And it's gonna be making some headways, I think, even in research areas and EDU and whatnot, um, because there's a lot of, um, instances where uh, people need an operating system um, to do research or whatever um, and have a lot of dependencies that work well with the container metaphor, right? That work well with a container environment. So I would encourage folks to check out uh, the Fedora Core OS um, uh, website. And also there's a working group there. That's a really excellent working group. I participate a little bit in it. There's, um, uh, Christian uh, Glombeck is uh, another person uh, that's on that, that participates. Um, so definitely check out uh, Fedora Core OS as well. We use OKD for the development. We build um, software on it. We run lots of applications. Um, so it's our workhorse for everything and more and more applications. Um, from central IT or our internal for internal customers or for external customers are running on on OKD currently. I, think, I don't know how much developers we already have on it. It must be more than a hundred now, and it's constantly growing. Each week I have uh, onboarding calls, and uh, I don't I don't can talk about the applications, but it's a very interesting task. Together with Azure and all the edit services you have there, databases and so on, and it's an absolutely great experience. I like also that you have the same user experience um, on premises and on yeah other clouds. That's also a, a big added value for me. That I know the stack is absolutely the same everywhere, um, and just below the operating systems there are the differences. You have Azure, you have vSphere, yeah, but everything um, going up the stack is the same. That's great. All right. Well, and I just created another poll because that's what I get to do. And um, so 
I'm just curious how many of you who are here um, today have actually joined the OKD working group. And by that, I, I kind of mean the, um, the Google group that gets you on the mailing list, gets you all the announcements. Um, that's sort of Diane's theory of joining. Um, and just curious how many of you have, this is really the first time you've um, participated in an event. Um, so that's uh, by the meetings, I mean the actual weekly, bi-weekly cadence of OKD working group meetings. Um, and um, if you haven't, um, why aren't you? Um, that's really the question. Uh, and how did you find out about this event if you're not on the mailing list? That would be a curious thing too for me um, as the person trying to corral all of you into participating and um, make sure you all have all the information you have and need. So I am thinking um, that we'll take 15 minutes before the next session um, starts. And um, everybody who's got a session, uh, there, I can see Andrew and Sri and other people there, um, you can join your sessions five minutes before the session starts. So the moderators can jump into that session and add and people can um, join the sessions that they want. Um, we'll, we'll see um, how populated some of them are. If everybody's in the vSphere one, then we will um, still motor through each of the other ones because then we will try and get those sessions recorded. So those, um, just like we did way back with the OKD marathon, the YouTube watching of these things was really um, key to getting um, more people on boarded. So, um, I am going to leave that poll running if everybody is okay with that and um, see if anyone has any more questions before we take this um, bio break. Um, and cool. I don't know if people know that um, a single node cluster of OKD OpenShift is coming uh, in the next in the next weeks. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think. No, in the, in the next month, yeah, 12 weeks are also, if you can count it, then it's a few. Um, and I think it's also a game changer for OKD, for all, especially for home labs to try it out and scale out uh, a full cluster, if, if that's possible, I don't know. That reminds me of another important difference between OCP. We as a community decide when to release and what to release, basically. We may go to uh, the feature Yosef has mentioned is bootstrap in place, meaning when you create a single node cluster, you can reuse one single machine to, to be a bootstrap and then it boots into master. So um, its feature is available in 4.8 and we already have OKD 4.8 nightly, so you can try them out right now. But when it becomes stable, it's up to us to decide because we might have entirely different requirements, like a huge focus on vSphere or a UPI and so on. And if we decide that we want this feature sooner before uh, RHEL cross well, OCP 4A becomes GA, we can do that absolutely. And OCP folks would be super happy about this. If we want to delay this because of the known issues and so on, we can delay this as long as we want to. Uh, but you can give it a try already now and report us back. We would be very, very interested in this. Yeah. What I'm going to show you guys that, that attend the, the single node workshop today is the, the old fashioned way to build a single node cluster. Um, and then for eight, we won't need the bootstrap node anymore. And that will be. Okay. So that, uh, Selatan um, has one more question for um, Vadim in the chat. Um, Joseph might have answered it, but um, does some of the cluster operators still on, uh, is, is some of the, the cluster operators still on Docker Hub? He read someplace that after Docker Hub limitations, all OKD images are moved to Quay.io. Partially correct. Uh, all the operators' images are already to way and we push our images there. There is, however, one component, which is samples operator. It still fetches images from Docker IO because another Red Hat project called uh, Software Collections is publishing that to Docker Hub as well. So what we'll do is we'll connect to them, ask them to move to uh, Quay IO because 
OGD clusters are using those images and get hit by rate limiting and ask them to push. Well, effectively, we'll be consuming just the QAIO images or from any other source where people are not rate limited because that's a huge issue for our home labs, in fact. And that breaks down our vSphere test. So uh, that's in progress. I don't think we have a tracking ticket for that, but it would be useful to have. Cool. And then um, Patrick is asking what are the minimum specs for a single node um, cluster? And Charo um, is going to be showing that in the um, single node cluster session and talk about that too. Um, so if you want to add that. And then, um, yeah. And so my, my goal for today, um, folks, the, the sessions can, I, I put the sessions to be very long. So if you don't end up taking the whole thing, I'll, I'll be online for everybody. Um, but, and we can stop the broadcast when the last session completes its and runs Peter's out, shall we say. Um, so that's my goal. And um, my other goal is too, is for everyone who's listening, um, who's a participant or an attendee, um, if there's something missing in the docs, um, you might, uh, it, Jamie, um, whomever, if one somebody could throw the docs that are in Mike's thing into the chat again. So while we take this break before we get started again, um, uh, take a look at that. That's where um, I would love everybody. My my fantasy island, this is where I live on, is fantasy island, is if we could get a couple of folks who are not in the working group or haven't um, made an logged an issue or done a pull request against anything to um, show, surface themselves today and look at that documentation, even if it's a grammar mistake we've made um, or you know additional stub for another um, deployment target that we haven't done. If, if you could um, take the time, take a look at that while we take the break and um, start um, you know seeing if you could, could help us out with these documentation um, issues that we have. We know we have them. Um, we are not perfect, um, and uh, though, and we do think you're all psychic and you know what we're talking about. So, um, if we are not explicit enough or you need more detail, let us know, um, and we will be taking these and cleaning them up, um, and then moving them to a proper location in the OKD um, official repo once we've gotten to a a, a good point um, there. And so, we'll still be referencing them probably in a few blog posts on OKD.io for the next little while. But um, the goal is to um, get some of you to take a look at that, see what we're missing, make a pull request, put an issue in, fix our fix our docs for us, help us help you. And um, well, we'd love to love to know more about where your what your use cases are for OKD, where you're deploying it, um, what issues you're running into. Really, um, this is this is your 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 team. Here. And yes, Joseph, thank you for the plug for the blog. Um, we just got that added, so there's you'll see my one blog about this event there. And um, if you have um, a deployment or a tip or a trick or something that you want to blog about in that repo for OKD.io, there um, there is instructions on how to add that. There are also um, not quite yet instructions, but if you are using OKD in production or um, in at an EDU site or on your home lab, um, and you would like to to list your organization as a participant in OKD, um, we're going to be adding that into the, the the notes, and maybe that's what I'll do this afternoon while you all are doing this: is add add um, not just how to do a blog post, but to how to add yourself to the, the little YAML file that I'm creating there too. So, because um, we would love to know who you are and where you're using it, um, and um, start growing the community. And yes. one, one real quick um, question clarification for, for Vadim. I know there's been some there's some chatter in the chat about multi-node, single node clusters. It is still possible to add workers to a single node control plane, right? Yeah. So so yeah. when we say going from a single node to multi-node, we're really talking about the control plane to go from which you need if you want high availability, I would highly recommend your control plane being more than one node. But if if you start with a single node cluster and you want to make your home lab bigger, um, you can add worker nodes to it. And if we get bored and run out of time in the single node workshop, we might actually try that. Um, I haven't done it in a long, long time, so. Yeah. 
That's what we like to hear. Doing might stuff blow on, it up. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to um, let everybody who's on the main stage pause, and um, we will be back. And um, I will I will hang out here for a little bit, and so people don't freak out and think we've dumped them. Um, but I'm going to go grab a glass of water, and um, I hope all of you take your bio breaks, and we will be back in um, 15 minutes. And for session folks, um, five minutes before, you can join your session. And as we sort of, Jamie and I will be in the back trying to help the session moderators make sure that they're set up correctly. And, um, and Vadim and Charo, I think I've empowered you to join, maybe not Charo, but Vadim for sure. And myself and Jamie, we can pop back and forth into other things and um, and help out as needed. And if you're really messing up and you lost yourselves, go over into the reception um, area in in hop in, and I will try and keep an eye on that. Um, so, good luck. Have a bio break, and we will be back in 15 minutes. Thanks, guys. <laughs>